Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Triangulation is brought to you by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Triangulation, episode 76, recorded October 31st, 2012. Jonathan Schwartz. It's time for Triangulation, the show where I, we get some of the most interesting, smartest, most provocative people in technology to join us for an hour and talk about their ideas and give you a chance to uh, ask them questions as well. I am thrilled. This was a last-minute uh, booking, and I'm thrilled. I've wanted to talk to uh, Jonathan Schwartz for a long time, formerly CEO and president of Sun Microsystems, uh, but he uh, is a very interesting fellow. He's got a new business called CareZone. We're going to talk about that. Uh, Jonathan, welcome to uh, Twit and to Triangulation. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Nice to meet you. Likewise. Your tenure at Sun was very was brief, just a few years. Well, I was there for 14 years. They acquired your previous company. They Lighthouse. acquired my previous company in 1996, right. and then I stuck it out until we sold the company to Oracle. You were CEO for five, three years? Three years, yeah. a little over three years. And, and, and did actually the most, uh, and I think it will live forever, most memorable resignation ever on Twitter, um, which I, rem- I remember. I mean, we, I thought that was so cool. You wrote a haiku that said, financial crisis stalled too many customers. CEO no more. <laughs> wow. That's a resignation. It was. But it, it also struck me as very transparent. Like you actually were talking not to shareholders, stakeholders, colleagues, em- fellow employees. You're talking to the world and you were, you were honest. Well, I, I think, you know, when you're talking as a, when you're talking in general, it's nearly impossible to segregate your audience and say, okay, I'm only talking to these people. Right? <laughs> Don't everybody listen. else is going to be listening. Right. And so, you know, I was talking to all the folks who cared about Sun, and they were our customers, our employees, our partners, our families. Everybody wanted to know what was going on. We wanted to be clear about it. You were very honest. You you now have a, I don't know if you can maintain it, but a blog of things you couldn't say when you were CEO. Yeah, somehow that that cease and desist letter from Oracle really kind of put a bit of a kibosh on that. So it's over now. It's not over. It's it's quiet more than it's over. uh, really, Oracle said that you better not. You may not. You may not be CEO any longer. But we would prefer you. I do think not. they they wanted to make sure that all of the insight and wisdom about what actually went on stayed <sighs> insight and wisdom and didn't actually see the light of day. But as time has gone on, there's They're more, not more of it's now. come out. No, you of course talk. not. And the good news: Oracle's not watching this. Right? They don't because watch they... <laughs> this. So you can be honest here. Yeah. Um, it's you're, uh, you know I'm reading the Wikipedia article, and you'll correct me if if uh, we've got anything wrong here, but. Um, one of the things they say, which is kind of interesting, is that you nearly died during a, a horrific train crash Yeah, uh, in 1986. <laughs> it's amazing how stuff like that ends up in Wikipedia. But that's, um, a, but that's an interesting and biographical it, it, tidbit. And it was a very important experience in my life. I was on a, a train uh, with my girlfriend at the time, and we were uh, leaving D.C. on our way back to New York. And uh, for those that remember at the time, I think the, the Super Bowl was on. And the reason I know that is, um, or there was some big game. I think it was the Super Bowl. It's because my parents were walking. They told me later my parents were walking through a shopping mall. And then they, they recognized that the, the broadcast of the game had stopped because this accident had occurred. And there were all these people gathering around. And then they realized their son was on the train. Oh, my God. And this was back before the Internet and back before cell phones. Yeah. And so no one actually was able to communicate with anybody. So they just got in the car and started driving up to see horrifying. what was going on. It was horrifying. It was horrifying for everybody involved. Yeah. And so I remember that moment. You know, obviously, I remember the accident quite clearly. But I remember that moment with my family. I remember that moment with... The reunion. The reunion. I, I just... I mean, it's, just, it's, it's such a fundamental experience to come that close to losing your life. You begin to... I mean, the world changed. I was a young man. I was still in college. Um, but your perspective on everything just changes. Like, well, you get okay, serious. What are we, you totally get serious. You get, you get serious and also lighthearted simultaneously because right. all of a sudden right. all the stuff you thought mattered doesn't. <laughs> Move on. It's a great lesson. It you... is a fabulous lesson. Thank, I, I wish there were less traumatic ways of delivering that lesson. But, yeah, it was a, it was a great lesson. Yeah, the, uh, any day could be your last. Yeah. And it, it, it both simultaneously spend, spend matters with, a lot and doesn't matter at spend all. Spend time with people you love. Yeah. Make sure you remind them of that frequently. Yeah, that's great. Um, and do the things that matter. And that's absolutely. Great. So did that lead to a career in technology? I think that led to, bizarrely, a level of self-confidence um, surrounding, well, what happens if I fail? I don't care. 
you know, <laughs> Let, let's go try. There's what, worse things right, that can happen. Right, what's the worst thing that can happen? <laughs> yeah. It's like there's no train you're going to run into, right. so move on, try right. this. So I think my appetite for risk went way up. Um, I think my enjoyment uh, in life went way up. That's great. Um, and it, it, all, it definitely emboldened me. It just gave me a sense of what is, what is really worth worrying about? What's right. really worth being afraid of? Right. Um, and what's not? And when you're, you know, you're 17, 18 years old, you're in college, you're trying to figure out what happens next, you're very worried about it, you've got to worry about a job, you've got to worry about this and that. And all of a sudden, I wasn't as worried because I wasn't worried about my family. I wasn't worried about my friends. I wasn't worried about, you know, my life. I could go worry about stuff that mattered. It gave you perspective on it's, what more really... More than anything else. Yeah. That's exactly what it did. Yeah. How valuable is that? I, I mean, I remember when you were CEO, it was very... You had a ponytail. Is it... You know, you weren't uh, wearing a... a ponytail? <laughs> didn't you? Oh, oh uh, I think you did. Uh, you weren't wearing a three-piece suit. You were very much a different guy. You, you embraced... Now, Sun had somewhat of an open source heritage. Uh, but you embraced <laughs> it. Yeah, but yeah. you embraced it. Yeah. In a way that was really inspiring. I mean, it was, it was a very different kind of tech CEO. And very deliberate. I mean, what, you know, we had a whole variety of problems, and almost all of them could be traced to our failure to remember our roots. And the roots Making of the company, Solaris for... Uh, make, no, engaging developers, full stop. Engaging and, developers. And, they, what, and I think the same is true today. If you have developers, right. you will be successful. If you don't have developers, it's going to be <laughs> you know, a tough road to hoe. Yeah. Um, and Sun had basically lost a lot of its developers. And yeah. we, the, the whole team of us, you know, everybody who was there, wanted to get those developers back. And you know, today, just looking at my startup right now, I can't think of a single proprietary product we use. There's just not one. I mean, maybe there's some proprietary services we use to kind of do, you know, analytics or do payments. But the foundational technology, you know, that we use is open source and free. And I don't think we're anomalous. I think that's just the way that the world works. How does that help you get developers? I don't understand the well, nexus. Most, well, uh, most developers are, are going to go off and make choices about how they go build a system. And Linux is a great example of that. If you're going to go pick an operating system, you are unlikely to go, with all deference and respect to your sponsors, you are unlikely to go off and pick up you know, uh, Windows and say, I want to go build a Windows app. You're going to go look for the highest volume opportunities that are out there. And you're going to also look at your budget and say, OK, I've got 10000 bucks. What do I want to spend it on? But that means not open source. That means, in many cases, proprietary. It means iOS, or it means... Uh Android. I mean, it doesn't necessarily mean open source. I guess Android is open source. But. Yeah, well, I think it, it's, it's hard to run against. Well, first of all, in the time that we were worrying about things, if you were looking at server-side operating systems, yeah. um, for the most part, you were likely looking at an open source operating system. It was system. LAMP stack. Yeah, it was totally LAMP stack. Yeah. The client side is a little bit different because you've got this con consumer phenomena, which is right. whether it's open source or not doesn't matter. What matters is are there a lot of consumers using right. it? And if they are, that's where developers are going to go. I see. So I think first there is a you know, just a, a barrier for any, any developer, whether in a big company or a small company, which is how much money do you have? And if products are free, you are more likely to be able, and they're easily accessible, you're going to get them, play with them, experiment right. with them. And in the event you build an application that then requires them because it's been baked into your, your app, then whoever delivered that to you now has an opportunity to sell you a product. And so if you are built on MySQL back in the Sundays, we could then sell you premium services or hosting services or anything related to MySQL. If you started building on, you know, SQL Server, we didn't have that opportunity. Right. So, so were you part of the acquisition of MySQL? Was that your idea? No, no, no. I came into Sun through the acquisition of my startup in 1996, uh, a little company called Lighthouse Design. And Lighthouse Design had been started in the late 80s, not to date myself. Um, and a bunch of us got next, together. It was developing for Next Step. We built for Next Step. And so we were the, um, the biggest fish in a little raindrop. And, uh, and we built all the big productivity applications in the Next Step environment and a bunch of developer tools as well. Some of the best people I know were Next Step developers. There was oh, something absolutely. about that, eco not, not merely Tim Berners-Lee, yeah. but th there was something about that ecosystem that just really attracted the best. Yeah. Why? Uh, because was I think it was... Uh, elegant? I, I think it had a very clear purpose. Everyone knew what we were there to go do, um, and it had a very charismatic leader. Um, Steve Jobs, obviously, yeah. you know, no longer with us. Yeah. And so I think that that level of passion and focus and intensity really drives, really attracts the best people. Folks want to be a part of something that's great, and if you've got an opportunity to build something great, they're going to want to join you. So, uh, uh, did Sun come to you and say we want to buy Lighthouse? Did they want to be in next step development? What, how did so that So if you if you look at Objective C in Java and you blur your eyes just a little bit, they kind of look a little similar. <laughs> yeah. So you know back in the day we had these productivity apps that were you know they were selling very well. We had 
um, you know, 25, 30 developers and around $10 million in revenue. So we were. What were the you know, apps? Uh, they were. Uh, they had names like Concurrence and Diagram and Taskmaster and uh, OpenWrite and. So, so you they were, were productivity tools. Productivity you know, tools, for, tools for next boxes. For event, next boxes. Yeah. And and remember that was next, a tiny market. It was a raindrop, a little tiny. Yeah. Um, and remember, next split hardware and software. Right. And then the software was partially licensed to Sun and partially right. licensed to HP because we were going to, you know, back then. It became OpenStep. It became OpenStep and then then, then stopped. Being <laughs> then became <open> no step. steps. <laughs> and became no then became OS X. Became, yeah. Which is interesting. Falter step. Yeah. The, uh, yeah. And so at the time, um, this was 95, you know, we kind of finally stood up and said, okay, this internet thing is happening. And boy, we have all these assets. We have all these frameworks, all this code, all these apps. How hard would it be for us to rebuild them, recast them in an internet context? For Java. For Java. Or for the web broadly. And so we had a few bidders. Um, and uh, That was prescient, though, in 95. Yeah. Now everybody understands, oh, software as a service, yeah, yeah, web-based yeah. software, cloud. But that's what you're basically we, saying. And we, d we did a bunch of stuff. It's like when I think back on um, you know, the team we had, and it was mostly their decision-making. I mean, we had all these interesting philosophies when I was at Lighthouse. Like, all software shall be free to students. And, we, and, and our philosophy was actually, you know, it was, it was very clear. It's like, why? Well, because if it's not, they'll steal it. It's like, great, <laughs> let's get them out of the guilt ring. Let's just give them the software free. And um, there's a business model where they get, and, grow up and they start buying it. And, and you'll never guess what happened. All those kids who were using our software graduated, went to J.P. Morgan, and all of a sudden we were doing site licenses nice to J.P. Job. Morgan Chase. So that actually worked, this whole adoption thing. Nice job. So, uh, yeah, so in the 95, 96 time frame, we had a bunch of companies that wanted to come talk to us about what we were doing and if we could redo it with them. And Sun and ended up being the highest bidder. And so there's a guy there named Eric Schmidt, who was the CTO at the time, who um, ended up making the decision to buy us. And he was my first boss at Sun. And then he... It's really interesting how your career has brought you in contact with Jobs, Schmidt, Scott McNeely, some of the, some of the big minds yeah. of, of this era. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Bouncing off them like a pinball. Exactly. Yeah, what was Schmidt like at the time? Um, Did you get really, along? Oh, we got along great. Yeah. He was um, really, really smart. Just smart and lighthearted, and he was kind of in the R and D part, right? He was in the blue sky stuff. Yeah, yeah, no, I think he was running the before my time. He was running the software group, and then he was the CTO, and he was just—I uh, mean, he was an idea minute. He was great, neat. It was really good, neat. So you, uh, Sun acquired uh, Lighthouse. Uh, you, Ninety-six. In ninety-six, you went to work for Sun. I went to go work for Sun. Yeah, and and uh, it, we we left the little you know Lighthouse design as a standalone entity. And um, and that was really hard to do because you well, first of all you you know uh, having a little tiny company become a part of a really big company yeah. is a very difficult thing and so after about two years I would say I don't know eighty percent of the folks who were involved were gone oh and they had yeah. uh, they had left that's a big had, problem with these acquires aqua hires. hires which is it's hard to keep people who have this kind of entrepreneurial spirit in a big company you know I. I, I agree and I don't. And I, I mean, I, I think if, you, if you've really thought out what happens, I mean, I think companies that acquire others because they're acquisitive companies will forever have that problem. Right. And there are lots of great examples of acquisitive companies. They right. go off and acquire a mile a minute right. and they Yahoo keep 5%. Yeah, would be a good example. Right, yeah. and then they spew people out. Right. Um, others who have a really strong idea of what they want to get done and view acquisitions as a means of helping them go get that done mm -hmm are far more successful, um, and they're far more successful in keeping folks engaged because you're not just there to, be, to get a new T-shirt and a new business card. Um, you're there because or you play... Or stock options. Or stock options. You're there because you play an integral role in helping them right. achieve something. Sam Lesson moving to Facebook and creating Timeline is a good example. Right. There's a lot of engineers at Google, same thing. Right. And then there's a few, uh, like the Rasmussens, who struggled a little bit. They, right. You know. Well, I don't, I, there's, there's no perfect answer. What, right. what I've seen, having done a lot of acquisitions in my day, is right. um, if you are acquiring people to help you achieve something greater than what they're currently able to achieve, right. they all want to see that as right. well. And they see the flag in the sand. They say, oh, we can do that. That we can do. Yeah. And that's well, our and goal. It, and sometimes it's nice to have a billion dollar you know, balance sheet behind you and yeah. 10,000 salespeople across the world. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, they're great. So uh, you now, now what happened? So Scott McNeely was running Sun when you when you joined, right? Um, and you you and Scott be, you became his right hand. How did it, how did you end up as CEO? That's kind of an interesting transition. It was an interesting transition. <laughs> did you imagine ever that that would be the <laughs> outcome of this acquisition? 
that you'd be running the company in a few years? Uh, no. Um, <laughs> I mean, that's kind of weird. No, but, I, you know, everything I've ever done, I've just cared really deeply about. I don't want to spend my time on things that I don't care about. Right. And, um, you know, and being a part of Lighthouse, I mean, believe me, the Next Step Marketplace was a hard place to, to run a business. Yeah, yeah. We still ran a business that was profitable. Well, it you, made and money. You, and you it got grew. it in the nick of time. Because and we, in we a few years, it was going to go away entirely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it would or it wouldn't. I mean, it became a part of Apple, and it's now, you know, you've got Next Step on your phone now. Right. Um, and I think when I was a part of Sun, uh, you know, I just cared really deeply about everything that was going on That's from... Neat. You know what we were doing, for whom we were doing it, how we were doing it, who was a part of the team, and um, and I think you know that definitely made it a lot easier to truly invest in what we were getting done. It also made it easier to say I would love to do more. I'd love right. to help out, you know, yeah. Yeah. and you know all these different ways. And so, you know, I had the the luxury of picking great bosses. Um, and along the way, I just had lots of great opportunities. Well, it's a legendary company. I mean, a great company. Some of the best minds in technology worked at Sun. Jo you know, jo I mean, all the things that Sun had. Absolutely. It had, I mean, just an, an, an exceptional... And Solaris. I yeah. Mean, no, I... I ZFS. You, you, I mean, you, you, you know? don't have to convince me. I mean, no, I know. Absolutely <laughs> I'm you know, marveling. I mean, it really... It, so what happened? What went wrong? I mean, well, this I, is a great company. So I think a, a few things, you know, if I can kind of go back and, and visit what happened. You know, I remember early on when Linux first started, you know, uh, evolving in the mid-90s. And I remember watching, you know, uh, my developer friends and watching what, what was going out in the marketplace. And, you know, if, if you think back at a company like eBay, eBay, you know, Pierre Omidyar had a Sun workstation, did a bunch of, you know, noodling around, built eBay. And then by the time, you know, eBay was really, really big, Solaris was baked into how everything was done. Right. Right? And so... There's the no going back. There's no going back. So the decisions that Pierre made at the very beginning informed the revenue opportunity for Sun. So now imagine how many people were actually using Sun workstations to create their businesses in the mid-90s. And what operating system they could actually they, pick. They, they were using Linux. And they were unable to pick... Right. Solaris, because right. the decision had been made at the time right. to get out of that. That was gonna. That was only doing you know Intel a favor. Right. So that wasn't. You they know, actually moved it off Intel. They moved it onto Intel, announced it was being canceled, <laughs> um, which is not again because developers are a skittish lot. They want things. That's that not good. Yeah, that's not yeah, good. yeah, yeah, yeah. It scares um, everybody. That scared everybody, and so there's this whole generation of developers that were gone, and therefore a whole generation of market opportunity that right. was gone. So partially, what we were trying to do was just try to recover that work as hard as we could to go get, you know, back on the the laptops and in front of the developers and in their development environment, so that we could be a part of that next wave of market opportunity. It's a great insight, though. It's insight you had giving students uh, uh, lighthouse identical. software. It's the same thing. Is that if you get in at the beginning. You become an incumbent, an entrenched. Well, and you've not only sowed your technology seeds, you've given people the skills, you've right. given people the preferences, the culture. I mean, everything but, that you've thought about, they now have baked into how they build infrastructure. And conversely, if you miss the boat, it's very, very hard to jump on it after if it's le you left appear. I mean, and, you and can't. This was, you, you absolutely can't. And, and that's what Sun learned, basically. Uh, yeah, yeah. I would say they, they the boat absolutely sailed. Did. The boat sailed, and it, and it was therefore you know, uh, up to us as a team to try to figure out where else we could go. And so we weren't going to give up on the idea of trying to recover those developers because you can never give up on that. You've always got to be going after them. And acquiring MySQL was certainly a part of that. Uh, but we also had to do as good a job as we could with some really tough customers. I mean, Sun's uh, customer base was really concentrated. I mean, probably a third of our customers were banks. And I don't know if you remember back in the 2008-2009 time frame, that was a that was a hard place to be because a lot of banks were going bankrupt, <laughs> you know, across the world. Uh, they were know. using Sun Sun workstations to develop derivatives and put themselves out of and business. They absolutely did. And so, all, you know, seeing a third of your revenue just yeah. basically go poof, wow. you know, that was a tough thing to deal with. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, and so we had a, a bunch of struggles, but we also had good relationships across the marketplace, and that enabled us to go talk to other industry participants and, and frankly, to try to say, hey, what could we do together? And you know, leave it up to them to figure out ways, you know, that we could partner. And that's ultimately what happened. And it wasn't a smooth process. And, you know, there was a, a lot of drama in the interim. But, yeah. uh, you know, that's where we ended up. You, 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 yeah. So it's interesting, though, that you say developers are more important in, in a way than customers. It starts with developers. In for the enterprise, yeah. Um, no, in fact, we, we, I was just with a, uh, another company that was talking about how they were going to, uh, you know, build this new high-end system and it was going to totally uh, eviscerate the low end of the marketplace. 
And I was thinking, in the history that I've been a <laughs> when, part when does I've, that happen? I've never seen that happen. <laughs> you cannot kill from above. I mean, that, that may work in the military, but it doesn't work. <laughs> Only in the military. <laughs> but it doesn't work in my marketplace. Huh. And so, yeah, you've got to build a high-volume product that is then, in some sense, preferencing the marketplace to pay attention to you. And I think you know, that, that is the foundation of the freemium model. The freemium model is not simply isolated to good consumer services. It's identical for developer services. You know, Amazon is vacuuming up the marketplace. They're not doing it from the top down. They're doing it from their website. Right, um, right. And as that happens, that creates a Isn't massive market opportunity. Yeah. yeah, that's why freemium really works. It does work. Well, it, it, whether it works, free distribution... Is, is the simplest and fastest way to proliferate your technology across the world. That's how, obvious. What's hard to figure out is how to make money on it then. I, you know, I don't think it's that hard. I, I, I think it's a lot harder to figure out how to make money if you don't have any customers. <laughs> so I'd rather go <laughs> solve, solve problem one, right. get a lot of people right. using your stuff, solve problem two, figure out what it is that they're interested in paying for. Right. And I think for, for, for company after company, what you will see, and we, certainly what we've seen, is oftentimes people just want to pay because they like what you're doing. Right. And they want to pay because right. they think you're doing a valuable service for them. Right. So, you know, you can't miss that. Right. I mean, if you watch what happens with Kickstarter and crowdsourcing... People th- want to give you there's, money. There's a whole lot of money out there Oddly that, wants, enough. that wants to find a home. You've just got to be a good job. You've got to do a good job of building a way for it to get to you. Yeah, we talked a few weeks ago to Phil Leibin of Evernote on this right. show. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly that. And I think he has observed that, that people don't really need to pay for, for Evernote, but they want to pay for right. Evernote. And the music industry never really got that, did they? They, they? I think people even will pay for content. Well, I mean, I, I, yeah, I've had an interesting history with the music industry because we built a lot of infrastructure when I was at Sun for both the providers of the media as well as the... The creators. The, the yeah. distributors of the media who yeah. weren't always legitimate in how they yeah. were distributing it. Yeah. Um, you know, but the funny thing was, before iTunes, a massive amount of music was being stolen. Right. And then iTunes Napster. came along and a massive amount of music was being purchased. All of a sudden. All of a sudden. Why? Because all of a sudden it was easier to Point just buy access. it. Point of access, yes. <laughs> it was easier to buy it. And people, I think, want to buy it. Yeah. They don't right. Necess- no one wants to steal. Right. And I think if you give them a fair price and a, and a good opportunity, they'll find a way to pay you. These things all seem so obvious when you say it. Open source works. Give away. You build your customer base. Give stuff away. People want to pay. It's, but at the same time, the, most of the world doesn't seem to get it. Well, I think for many people, it's counterintuitive. It's counterintuitive. I mean, you know, I, I think the How am I going to make money if I give it away? Exactly. Well, and, and we still had that, you know, time after time. I mean, I've spent lots of time with folks who are maybe, and I don't think it's a generational thing. I think it's a, it's a cultural thing. You know, you sit with a CIO who is, you know, I, I, I saw this a hundred times. You, you sit with a CIO who's built a massive distributed global application that relies upon MySQL. Right. And he doesn't have to pay you anything. Right. It's free. But he's it's looking source. for a way to give you the biggest check he can to make sure that you totally protect him in the event something goes wrong. And the cost of downtime to him is a million dollars an hour. Right. And when you deliver him a purchase order for premium support for $20 million, he's like, Big, wait, 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 that's between, a day. Between the seat cushions. Let me get that for you. <laughs> no sweat. Right. And so that's counterintuitive because for most people, you take them off the street, you put them right. in the CIO's you know, shoes, and you could say, okay, you could save $20 million. And right. in the moment, they'll say, that's brilliant. I'd love to save $20 million. Right. It's like, no, because the moment something happens. It's a foolish economy. It's a, it's, you've, it's a yeah, you've yeah. made a bad choice. Yeah. So, and I think that applies, you know, I watch, you know, I've been reading the LA Times recently and, you know, there was a period there where I wanted to read the article and I couldn't actually read the article unless I paid. So I said, fine, close the window. Yes. I mean, I assume at some point somebody at the LA Times realized, wow, this doesn't appear He's to be not working. reading for us. it. <laughs> we got to get so. Jonathan to read these articles. No, but, but, you know, when I close that window, it almost gives me satisfaction. Like, okay, fine. And, and so I think we are very much in a marketplace now where consumers are in charge as opposed yeah. to 25 years ago where good enterprises news. were in charge. And great news. And that means if you do a good job of pleasing consumers, they'll reward you by giving you money. I'm guessing you have lots of opinions about. I have how, no opinion. How businesses are being run now, Facebook, Twitter, Apple, sure. Google. Do you, do you, can you talk about that or would you prefer not to? Oh, I'm happy to talk about it. You don't you like mind? Me? No, I'm not sure my opinions <laughs> are all that, that noteworthy. Well, I'm interested. Um, I think they, you know, all those businesses are making choices which are, you know, which are good for them. And well, they're playing a game of chess. They're trying to make a choice which is good well, for them. Well, I guess, you know, the problem I have with, um, you know, Facebook and Google and to a lesser extent, Twitter and a much lesser extent Apple, um, you know, there, there's this, uh, there's a level of duplicity in what's going on, which is you, we'll, go, we'll give you all of this great stuff and that's how we're going to buy your privacy. 
Right. And then you're not actually our customer. You're our product. Right. We're not going to tell you that. We're going to call you our users and our right. customers. And then we're going to go sell access to you to our advertisers. And so, you know, I was watching, uh, you know, some of the European privacy legislation and the dialogue around that and people fighting privacy, saying it's, it's bad for consumers. It's like, you know, I've never heard a consumer wake up and say, I've got too much privacy. It's time for me to, you know, <laughs> tear everything off and live in the open. Um, but your predecessor said very famously, privacy's dead. Get over it. Um, I think what he said is, yeah, something to that end. Similar. And, and when you're an infrastructure provider... That's a very salacious thing to say, but you're not giving up anything by saying Scott it. Scott liked to say salacious things. Well, he did because we could ride on both sides of that, right? right? We could right. ride on you the don't privacy really care. advocates. Right. Right. We're here. Right. We're, a, we're an arm supplier. We're neutral. So you think Google needs, let's use Google as an example. Facebook could be also, uh, should be more upfront with its users about what the trade-off is, what the, what the economic tit-for-tat is? Um, I, I think, it, you know, uh, as a consumer... I would like to have vastly more uh, control and much simpler control over what information is actually being tracked and where it's going and how it's being used. And I would like to very... Of course you would. Right. And but, but isn't it a little disingenuous to say, well, look at all, Facebook, it's free. Look at that. Look at all that great stuff I get from Google. It's free. It's free. I'm, I'll take it. And then when Google says, well, yeah, but we got to pay for the servers somehow. Right. I, I guess if they were more transparent about that, I would have you know less of a hard time They're about pretty it. transparent. I mean, they've got a dashboard. You can see what they know. You can turn off stuff. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure. How, most... how transparent do you want them to be? Well, I want them to be as transparent that, you know, the grandma they can be. Grandma right. understands. Well, the folks who don't actually understand what's going on, that a legacy of information is being kept about them, right. that it can be used in ways that may not be you know necessarily ideal for them. You know, you know why we don't tell anybody that? I'll, I'll, be, I'll be Google. Because if they knew, they'd be terrified and they'd turn everything off and then we'd have no business model. We can't tell them. We can't be honest with well, them. Well, I think if your business model is predicated upon deceit, <laughs> you've already got some challenges that you maybe haven't faced up to. Is it possible for uh, a Facebook or Google to succeed and be honest with their customers and say well, this is I, the trade? I would like to believe that that's the foundation of every effect. But you business. just said you, don't, you want to have absolute control and you probably would choose, you would opt for more privacy, that, not that, less. That's not right? necessarily true. I mean... You know, Esther Dyson a long time ago had this this great perspective on. Uh, so if you look at the retail industry, so you walk into your average grocery store, they make as much money on the data about you as they do right. on the products they're selling. Yeah, that's why they push that club card. Which is they push the club card. And so uh, you know, Esther had I was I was part of a, uh, a panel with her a while back, and she was saying, look, it's totally okay that they're doing it, but I would like to be in charge. It's my information, and I'm happy to sell it back to them. And I probably would sell it back to them because I don't care that much about how many apples I bought when they introduced this new discount. Right. But I would like to be asked. So in the healthcare environment right now, uh, there's this piece of legislation in the U.S., which is replicated in many ways around the world, called HIPAA. Yeah. And what HIPAA says is it's your data, full stop, end of sentence. There's no, like, duplicity and we're not going to really you know, tell you what you can and what you can't. If I make a request of my healthcare provider that says give me my medical records, they are, you know, by, by federal legislation, they're obligated to give me that data. It's mine. It's no a portability questions. and privacy act. Absolutely. Two Ps in HIPAA. And so, in, uh, so why is that any different? in the right. banking world? Why is it any right. different in the browsing world? Why is it any different about where I'm driving around in the city? That's my information. So, the, so should there be a HIPAA, a global HIPAA for I privacy? I absolutely believe there ought to be a global HIPAA for all information about me. If it's being aggregated by somebody else without my knowledge, mm -hmm. and even if it's with my knowledge, again, I just want to know how it's going to be used. And, and do you want like way. a price chart? Like, okay, you tell us this, it's worth this much and that kind of thing? No, I just want to know everything what they're they doing. know. And I want to know what their plans are with it. And I want, their, and I want them to ask my permission to use it. Google would say, well, we're doing that. We've got a very clear English written privacy policy. Yeah, it's and 57 pages long. It's the <laughs> clearest thing I've ever read. You know, it's like... <laughs> By the way, you, you, you've, you've won about a thousand fans in the, uh, in the chat room. We're absolutely <laughs> agreeing with you. But I also see the other side, which is that we get a lot of free services. Google's a good example. I mean, there are a lot of... I use all the Google stuff. It's great. And, uh, and you're right. I would like control, but I would... But I, and I would like the choice... But I think if you're sophisticated, you know, right? And if you decide to use Google Docs and Google Calendar and Google Mail, you know. They're what did you just say? If you're sophisticated, you know? Yeah. And so what does that mean? Like, the like a lot of people don't know. Like the naive people there. Those you know, poor schmucks don't know. Right. Yeah, oh, well. <laughs> <laughs> don't know. Right. So the 1% but they are really clued for, in. They, they got it. They but, understand it. So but, it's okay. But and, why, why aren't people thinking to my, themselves, well, why am I getting this for free? You know, I'm not, I'm not worried about that. What yeah. I'm worried about is 
uh, I believe that the information about me is mine. It is. It is no one else's. No you one are, denies that. Right. Well, yeah. I think a lot of companies deny that right. by saying, hey, we gave you this really complicated opaque right. document. And you Just gave us permission. Right. You gave us permission. You signed right. the terms and conditions. Right. Um, so what do – so – and you think a government regulation is the right way to, to do this? Uh, no, I think I – think, uh, Industry effect, regulation. Effective privacy legislation. Okay. I'm not, I'm not a huge fan of federal, you know, oversight and, Cause and you know, Because notoriously they're not um, very good at – Doing this stuff. Well, mm. they did a pretty good job with HIPAA. HIPAA was good. Yeah, HIPAA right. was great, and HIPAA can and and what I'm talking about can be bounded very clearly. Yeah. And I think it, it would be interesting, sh you know, if we pursued that to see who would show up on the other side, because inevitably you have a bunch of companies <laughs> showing up saying, "You don't need more privacy. You don't trust me. Trust me." You know. <laughs> That's exactly why they have all those people running around in the halls of Congress. Making sure that nothing like and this comes And that's exactly out. why we built CareZone. So tell, okay, so we're going to talk about CareZone. This is your new startup. Yeah. Um, you launched it uh, just this year. Uh, Valentine's February. Day. Yeah. Valentine's Day, February. So what is CareZone? I got it all wrong because I just assumed it was a healthcare portability. No. So I, uh, about um, a little over a decade ago, um, I had my first child and, uh, and he had a bunch of complications and it happens. And so all of a sudden, my wife and I had to start managing and tracking a bunch of information. And some of it was health-related, but it was developmental. We needed to know who you know, this therapist was and this babysitter was, and we had a caregiver here, and we needed to just keep track of stuff. And then we had to share the stuff. And then every parent has run into the experience of, okay, uh, you know, uh, my partner and I are going out to dinner. That's why we have a babysitter. So here's all the emergency contact oh, information. Oh, that long list. That of, long list. Yeah. And where is that? It's usually handwritten out. Yep. So that ought to be digital at some point. Yeah. Um, and when you look at the kind of information you're managing, that's not the kind of stuff you want to share with your neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And uh, and then my brother... You or know, Google. Or Google. And then my brother's family had a bunch of issues, and they, he had a bunch of folks he wanted to keep up to date, and he needed a safe place to do it. And then my parents, as I uh, was joking with them recently, just decided to get old one day. It's like, boom. <laughs> How you <know>? dare you? <laughs> How dare you? Um, <laughs> you know, and they did me the favor of actually caring for me when I was vulnerable, so I figured oh, I would try to help out golly. with them. And now, you know, you don't want folks to know about... You know what's going on with your dad's surgery right. and when he's getting home, and you know right. how they manage their house and what the what the pass lock to his his garage is, and you know where do you put the you know bank passwords and online accounts, and so all of a sudden we, and especially and I think in our generation when you're kind of sandwiched between children and 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 your parents, where is it that you have a safe place to keep stuff first and foremost that has a privacy policy that's actually you know about a page long and rational and says no ads, no data mining, we don't have access to your data, full stop. Um, and then secondarily, one that you can share with a non-sophisticated family, as well as extended family, caregivers, babysitters, somebody who stops in to check on your dad's meds. So that's what we wanted to build. That's what Walter Smith, uh, my co-founder and I, wanted to do. We wanted to build a safe place that could help you care for your family, that you could share with your extended family, and that would just be a family utility, just a very simple social resource. Is it free? It is free. And well, how the hell are you going to pay for this? You know, that's not my priority right now. <laughs> I mean, my priority you is You got a sure data that. mine, dude. There's no money in this. You got to you got to That's true. Not We're going <laughs> to yeah. No, I am not I'm I, I I will tell you from from the users we have um, oh, I'm sure they're thrilled. They're our, getting a great freebie. Our, no, no, no. Our revenue model is not going to be a challenge. It'll be freemium. It, it will undeniably be freemium. Yeah. And I think you're going to see some... People will want to give you money. They, they already do. And yeah. it's like, folks, we don't have billing set up. It's like, stop it. <laughs> don't, stop it. Don't. We can't take one. Yeah. Out. And so I, I'm, I'm not worried about I that. I love that. So you just say, no, we, we, if we build it, it'll work out. And our primary product, our mainline product is going to be a free product. And it's then an iOS be, app. It is an iOS app. Um, it is, we're, we're in our early release of the iOS app. So you can go to the, to the app store and just go look for CareZone. CareZone. And you'll okay. find our app. And, and again, it's still pretty basic on the, um, on the iPhone. It's more full-featured right now on the web. So there's a web version as well? Yeah. Okay. And, and, and they'll sync, obviously. So They are the same thing. I mean, and and then I could hand it off to the babysitter. I could say, here's my you, USB you can, key? Or? You, no, you just say, I invite you. She gets an email. She uh, says, great, I got your account. Right. And then when you catch her and smoking can, on the back porch, you hit the little boom, trash can button revoke. and boom, she's gone. <laughs> is, this, is that why Google Health failed? Because, I mean, Google Health... I think Google Health failed for a number of reasons. First of all, you know, do you really want to sell your health history to a company that's going to sell ads against it? I mean, give me a break. That's just an IQ test. That wasn't a business So people experiment. aren't so stupid as we thought. No, exactly. They figured that out. Secondly... Um, By the way, I gave them everything. 
I put it pumped everything. Well, you, you live a transparent life. I, I wouldn't care. be surprised if you don't take a microphone when you leave this building. But, yeah. um, you know, I think the other reason why Google Health failed is they presumed you actually wanted to track your information. Right. It's not me. No, it's not me. It's my kid. Right. And do you really think I'm going to, like, set up a Facebook account for my kid <laughs> so I can keep track of stuff and have it complete? No, no not going to happen. So where are you going to take care of somebody else? The set, this makes a lot of sense. I'm happy to hear that. Yeah, but I want to generalize it. I mean, it shouldn't just be uh, care. It should be everything. I have all my data. I need somewhere to put stuff and be able to granularly share my contact information. And there's instance. no question. And so I think one of the most, uh, it's interesting, we were talking a little bit before we started the, the live part of this. Um, sorry, the broadcast part we're of always, this. We're always uh, live, baby. You know, about the, uh, you know, the iPhone app, that probably right. the most useful feature for me right now with my, with my wife is we have a shared contact list. Right. And that shared contact list is everybody associated with my kids, everybody associated okay. with our little community, so and everybody have... associated with my parents. So because we're both on the same contact list, and there's six other people who have access to that list, whenever anybody makes a change, we're all made aware of it instantaneously. So I think there is, you know, for a family, there are a lot of things that go well beyond health. Health is just one of the items. Um, yeah, absolutely. And so at some point you do think you might... Because I'd like to do that gen more general. I, my kids are uh, are grown now, so I don't care about them anymore. And my parents aren't quite dead yet, so I don't care about them. So I, <laughs> so, that's, no, there's, there's more there's, we could store. No, there absolutely is. And there's yeah. simple stuff. Like, so whenever you walk into your house and you look at that desk, that, right. that desk that used to serve like a utility. Yeah. Because it used to be you where you the put, dining room table? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah that desk. To, yeah. Where you used to put your computer yeah. before you stopped, you, yeah. Know, yeah. you know, carrying a computer. Yeah. Um, you know, so where do you keep the deed to your house? Where do you keep right. the, no you know, the, the key pass to your garage? No you know? idea. And so wh where are all the kind of little pieces of private information right. that you care about? How do we give you a place to put them that can be shared but still be secure? That's exactly what we're trying to achieve. Carezone.com. Well, you do have, after a year, you pay $5 a month. Yeah, I think we're going to change that. <laughs> <laughs> the year isn't up yet. So well, we'll... so partially what, what happened was, you know, we unveiled the service in February. We had this big rush of users come in, and we made all these assumptions about how people would be using it and what they would be doing with it. Um, and so we established a relationship with an autism uh, foundation called Autism Speaks. And then we started hearing from folks who had autistic kids what they care about. And it wasn't what we expected. Oh, a huge number of autistic parents care about the diet that their child has right. because they appear to have some incredible gluten sensitivity. Right. Um, we started working with folks in the Parkinson's community, assuming that what we were going to do was, again, focus on folks who had maladies. And what we heard from them was they had these very complicated you know, medication regimens, which is why our medications you know, features have gotten a lot more robust and powerful. But what we've seen along the way is that if you have an autistic child, statistically, you also have one who's not autistic, who's not on the spectrum. And if you know, one of your parents is you know, uh, unfortunate uh, enough to have Parkinson's, you have another parent who doesn't have Parkinson's. Right. And so you know, it's not just about you know, people with health issues or challenges. It's about people who are living life. Right. I mean, everyone will get old. Everyone has parents, alive or dead. Everyone's got parents. Right. Many people have kids. Some of them have challenges. We all just have this kind of stew of information, some of which is brilliantly well served by Facebook. I mean, I wouldn't take anything away from that. I think they've done an amazing job of building an incredibly valuable service, but it's for a very specific part of your life. And they can't do this because we already know that they, they, they sell our information. So yeah. well, the, yes. we don't trust them. We, we have, privacy is toxic to their revenue model. Right. It is the foundation of ours. So I think we're not worried about Facebook <laughs> moving into our space. Well, I wouldn't be. I mean, Google tried with, uh, I mean, Google with Health. You yeah, know, they, they tried. They did. Didn't yeah. Work so good, but right. they tried. Um, all right, so people can go to carezone.com, sign up there, start entering data there, get the iOS app. Are you going to do an Android app? Uh, we're Please? absolutely going to do an Android good. app. I beg of you. Absolutely. And you said it's all open source uh, software. What are you What are you using? Uh, what is are it, we not using? Is it Rails? Is it, uh, is so it it's, Django? Uh, it's Rails uh, and obviously JavaScript and building on JS uh, Query or and JS Query and Backbone Node and running on stuff. Postgres and Love it. on Linux and Amazon's you know not core my part SQL, of our infrastructure. Huh? Not MySQL. We're all about <laughs> understanding IP licenses. And, I like Postgres. Um, Postgres we love Postgres. Postgres, Postgres yeah, is a great a community choice. and a great product. Yeah. Very interesting. Well, it's really nice to meet you. I, uh, you, you were a breath of fresh air when you were running uh, Sun, and uh, Sun, uh, you know, is now part of Oracle. It is, yeah. and they're doing. You know, they, How, how'd you and Larry get along? Uh, you know, you went. To, you, <laughs> no, you, you were shopping Sun. 
actively shop. You were shopping it, weren't you? We, uh, shopping's not really the word. We, we were looking for alternatives. When, when, when our business, when we saw what we saw, which is that just an utter kind of global economic collapse, yeah. everyone was out looking for opportunities. Yeah. And I wanted to make sure that we had a safe landing. I wanted you, to make sure that, you know, in the event of things, we you had were a to good be. steward. And yeah. we, we, and I know we frustrated an awful lot of people because they, they all told me. According <laughs> to Wikipedia, you, Scott McNeely wasn't so happy. There were a lot of people who weren't very happy because they didn't like the idea of this company ultimately being sold. No, because Sun is legendary. It, it, and Sun it was like legendary. Apple for a certain group of people. And absolutely. But, um, you know, I think what folks have to remember is, you know, the majority of our business, the majority was selling spark boxes. Right. So I don't care how much it worked. I mean, it's when that business is shrinking at the rate mm. that it was, mm. it was nearly impossible to grow the software side of the business or the service side of the business fast enough to offset that loss. Had and you gotten in there earlier knowing what you know, do you think you could have made it, a, a, the, the company could have survived? I, I mean, I think it would be arrogant. Uh, to suggest that. I think there are some decisions I wish that we had made differently. I yeah. wish I had been more persuasive, and there's right. a whole bunch of us that wish we'd been more persuasive. But on the other hand, you know, when you're um, when you're in the midst of it and you know, yeah. you're no, trying to make decisions, everybody's got. It's and look, th that is a company that was very well managed, created an enormous number of jobs. Um, and I remember, you know, I value. had this an immense amount of value. And, um, you know, and some of my favorite people are still there. Yeah. And I wish them well because I think it's a, yeah. it's a tough environment. But, you, you know, you look at what Meg Whitman is going through right now at HP. Mm. You know, we sold Sun for about uh, $8 billion or so. Mm-hmm. I haven't checked HP's market cap mm -hmm. recently, mm -hmm. but I wouldn't be surprised if they were sold for about what Sun was sold for, because there's just not a lot of IP there that's going to be sustainable. And so we were very focused on making sure that we got $8 billion and not right. $1 billion. Right. Um, so I think as difficult as it was and as controversial as it was, it was very much the right decision, and the board was very courageous to support the decision and to drive it forward. It, when you, when you, know, you know how difficult it is, and you look at something like uh, how Apple was run. It really is impressive to see how they threaded the needle I to go from a company that was three months away from doing, bankruptcy. Yeah. And so quickly to turn it around. It's really quite impressive. Well, I think what, you know, in, in some sense, the, uh, the luxury that, that Steve had was um, they were pre-disastered. <laughs> Right. So they were it's like they had their train wreck. They were, yeah. but they were shrunk. Yeah. And oh, so, I see what you're saying. Right. Yeah. So there wasn't this continual yeah. downdraft. So right. almost anything they did that began to turn the nose up <laughs> was going to be immediately, you right. know, beneficial. Right. And because remember, it was an awfully long time between the point where Steve took over again and when the iPod shipped. I mean, right. it was years and years and years. Right. And there was that that dark period in between, which it was struggling. You know, they got which, money from Microsoft, and they got money from Microsoft. And yeah. I remember, you know, talking to Steve in that period. It was not a pleasant time to be CEO oh, at Apple. I can only imagine. Um, and you know, but all that said, that company is so filled with innovative, creative, passionate people. As Sun, you know, was filled with creative, passionate people. What we needed was time, and it's the one thing we didn't have. Yeah. And the financial crisis really, you know, shrunk time. Yeah. And uh, and so. Could we have taken a different path? I think given the options we had at the time, you know, one of the, one of the things and just some insight for, for you and others about how the mechanics of shrinking a company work, if you're going to take care of your workers when you fire them, when you lay them off, which is an inevitable part of shrinking a company, you don't want to do that by saying goodbye. You want to do that by giving them a check and trying to take care of them and understanding it's a tough transition. So we maintained a very generous severance policy for a long time. And now when you do that, if you lay off 2,000 workers and you're giving them all six months wages, it ends up being a huge cash drain. So in the midst of the shrinkage, you've got this added pressure of we need to let people go, but that takes our cash balance right. down. There's some point where you go, folks, these lines are never going to cross. We can't do it. And we're not going to stand up and say that externally, because right. that's obviously a, a really, you that's know. A, that makes it even faster. That makes it even faster. Um, and so we had, you know, there's, there's just a lot of interesting, one day someone will write a book, it just won't be me, about what went on with IBM at the time. Because I don't know if you remember this, but IBM was out talking about, you know, geez. Uh, you you know, were there, they were your competitor. That, they were head-to-head They absolutely were our competitor. And, and I could never, of course, comment on confidential discussions that took place between Sun and IBM, whether they took place or not. But the FBI can comment on them because they disclosed in their indictment <laughs> they of Bob Moffitt, the whole thing. <laughs> um, uh, who was, you know, later, uh, as I said, indicted for, for insider trading. Um, you know, that it, they, 
that was really complicated. That yeah. made, made life a lot worse because you don't want to have your biggest competitor out there saying, geez, there are all these rumors uh, that, you know, that sun might be so... So it was just a really uh, complicated environment with, again, some of the most well-meaning, committed, smart people who are working their brains out, you know, trying to get good things to happen. But there's just a reality. Well, you, you actually convinced me that you had got the best of all possible outcomes. And, and I think we did. And, yeah. um, you know, it was a tough time. And, and let me tell you, it's a real pleasure being a part of a little tiny company <laughs> who, who every day, I mean, and know, it makes a difference in people's lives and people thank you. And to you, uh, totally. Yeah. Well, and also, you know, the, the, IBM's not going around bad mouthing. No, not anymore. <laughs> they just want us to buy IBM computers, but we don't buy computers. Yeah. That's um, good. They don't sell them really. So you're all right. You're good. They rent them. <laughs> they rent them. Um, you know, but being in a small company, you've got more, I've got more data today about the daily operations at CareZone than I had about the daily operations at Sun. Isn't that interesting? It you is. think the CEO would know everything. But it's just too complicated. Well, you can't. It, it, it's too complicated, and it's a business that's been built over 20, 25 right. years. There's Whereas lots this of corners, one, lots of nooks and crannies. Well, this one, you know, Care Zone, everything is instrumented. Everything. Oh, that's neat. Like, I could tell you how many, you know, visits we just had in the last 20 minutes. And, it, you know, was that intentional in the design? Absolutely. absolutely. You wanted to know it all. You well, want I wanted to know it all, and the, and the technologists we have are, are brilliant and fabulous, and they make sure that everything is as instrumented as it can right. be, in part because that allows us to make better decisions. I mean, so we, and we run. AB experiments all day long every day. Oh, really? And and you learn interesting stuff. I mean, so I'll I'll give you my favorite kind of counterintuitive learning. We, you know, we had on our landing page, we had three screenshots. So if you came to the page and you wanted to go look at, you know, uh, what the app was, go click on the screenshot, you get a, you know, a picture of what the contact list looks like or what the journal looks like. Mm -hmm. um, and then we had the page that was up that had no screenshots on it. And so we've been running an experiment recently. I and see no screenshots. And so which do you think would be more effective? The uh, one that gives you screenshots? Screenshots. No, the one with the happy lady smiling. The, ha the happy lady <laughs> smiling was, was constant between the two. Um, but, but there's no screenshots here. Yeah, why there's is that? Video. It's because screenshots suppress conversion. I mean, who would have thought that? <laughs> Um, and so, is, why is that? Do you think I can give you my theory? But we have a, you we don't have, know. You just know the result. Yeah, I don't yeah. go interview you know ten thousand right. users. But my theory is when you come to a site, you have a finite click allowance in your head. Right. And so if we soak up a couple of them on you a used up all the clicks. You've used up the clicks. So you may as well just go register and go get it that way. <laughs> so I, I don't know. But the, but the point but is. But by the way, that's an argument for obfuscation, not an argument for clarity. It 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 is. It totally I hate to is. tell you that. No, no, no. I mean, I think there's a lot of things that occur, and we have to make decisions about what the right answer is. Because right. I'll tell you, you know, Walter's response to that was, I hate that answer. It is the wrong answer. We just have to figure out a better way of conveying the information we want to you know, convey, because we don't want to say, we, we don't want to just have a, a landing page where you come and it says, register just do here. It. Just do it. <laughs> <laughs> register do here. It. We'll tell you about don't think company. about it. Do it. But that works. It does. It's often a challenge for people who want to be honest and responsible because think, sometimes that's not transparency may not be effective i think in the long term transparency is the most effective you have to believe you have to have an ethical belief and a foundational belief well but there's it, a reason why politicians are the way they are yes oh i i yes i totally believe that and unfortunately it's, it's true and disappointing in many ways but also very rational and there's a reason why it's the way it is and I suspect there's a reason why the way Google and Facebook are the way they are. Well, they built a revenue model. And I'm not right. saying it's a bad revenue model. It's just not my revenue model. Right, right. CareZone.com if you want to find out more. There's no screenshots, but just sign up. You know, it's free. <laughs> exactly. Watch the video. <laughs> Watch the, there's a little cart <laughs> I like these cartoon characters. These are very reminiscent of... Uh, there's a style. Is this, is this some... Is this... Did you go out and hire... Or, this, it reminds me a lot of the Virgin America... Uh, uh, safety film, but I don't. You don't know who who did this. It's cool. It's cute. Yeah, I like it. Watch the video. That's one click. That's one click. So there you go. And you don't have that many to more. spend, but we Register. want you to spend one on the video. <laughs> uh, it is such a thrill to meet you, and it, and you are live up to uh, you, the the promise. Uh, it's really uh, really interesting to hear your candid, honest uh, insights, and I wish you luck with CareZone. And come back, and we'll talk some more. Good. I look forward yeah, to it. Yeah. Yeah. Jonathan Schwartz, carezone.com. We do triangulation on Wednesdays, round about 3 p.m. Pacific, 6 p.m. Eastern time. With the time change, that is going to be 2100 UTC starting uh, next week. So uh, change your time. I will not be here for the next three weeks. Who's hosting? Do you know? We don't know. Who's hosting, Karsten? Uh, next week is Tom Merritt. <laughs> Come here, Karsten. <laughs> Put on your goggles. Tom Merritt will be hosting next week. And uh, we, I know we had promised uh, uh, horror uh, writer... Um, uh, what's his name? 
Richard Cadre. <laughs> Richard Cadre. We couldn't get Cadre had a, a, an emergency, so we were actually very happy that Jonathan's was. Here's the producer of our show, ladies and gentlemen, and he's the only person at the entire Twit uh, Brick House to wear a costume today. Oh, Liz, uh, Liz, 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 well, let's uh, see Batman. Ayaz, Where's Batman? Or Bat, Bat, Batgirl. <laughs> Ayaz was a cop. Ayaz is a cop. He was a cop. All right. Uh, Chad's a, Chad. Is Chad's got. He brought a. Same. He brought a trident. That does not count. <laughs> I'm very disappointed. <laughs> Wait a minute. Come here. Lorik's wearing. What? Lorik, are you the darks? Are you the Lord of the Sith? Uh, I, I don't have my mask. Oh, he doesn't have his mask. All right. <laughs> it's at the front. Well, none of you are getting candy. So get the heck out of here. <laughs> I'm throwing eggs at your house. Jonathan, thank you for joining us. Likewise. Thank you all for being here. We'll see you next time on Triangulation.